Alright, this is the fifth lecture for the 2014 Trotwood Fire and Rescue Paramedic Refresher uh, for February the 8th, 2014. This was a lecture that was put on by the ex EMS coordinator for Good Samaritan Hospital that was passed on to me. Okay, so our objectives we're going to review the anatomical and physiological features of the respiratory system, identify medical and traumatic causes of shortness of breath. And understand the best practices for treatment of shortness of breath. All right, so down through the, the hierarchy for the causes of death, remember that the number one uh, cause of death in the adult population is heart disease, then cancer, stroke, COPD, trauma, and pneumonia or influenza. So number four, this is the one we're dealing with right here. I think we all can agree that shortness of breath is probably one of our highest percentage of EMS calls between chest pain and shortness of breath, which sometimes just go hand in hand. It's a very, very high percentage of EMS calls for us. So it's more than about 300,000 deaths per year are contributed to um, respiratory emergencies. And approximately two thirds of all the patients presenting with difficulty breathing had an underlying cardiac or respiratory disorder. All right, so the structures of the upper airway. Um, when we're looking at the upper airway, we're looking at the nasal cavity, nasopharynx, the oropharynx, the uh, laryngopharynx. So that's pretty much, and then the larynx. That's everything from the larynx up. From the lower airway, you see it's got the left and the right primary bronchi, the bronchioles, and the trachea. Um, we're going to go through oxygenation and ventilation in the next lecture, so I'm not going to get too in depth in that. Um, essentially, you know, ventilation that's going to be the oxygen that's the oxygen ah, it's the exchange um, of carbon dioxide, and then the oxygenation is at the cellular level. So we'll get into that in just a little bit. Like I said, in the next lecture, we we'll go over oxygenation, ventilation, and the difference between the two. All right, so remember the upper airway, um, the nasal cavity. Uh, it's very, very important. You can see that, you know, that's why when we nasally innovate somebody, it actually goes straight back. Um, a lot of people think it curves, you know, up and then down, or they think that it just curves straight down. When we have to nasally innovate somebody, it's straight in and then down. Um, we have to be very, very careful that we don't go into the sinuses when we're nasally innovating somebody. So the oropharynx and the hypopharynx, um, very important. So the lower airway, um, once again, we got the trachea, we got the bronchial tree, primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, the bronchioles, the alveoli, and the lungs themselves. Remember that the lungs are the primary, it's the principal function for the restoration separated by the medium steinum and its contents. It's a base of each lung rests on a diaphragm. The apex extends about two and a half centimeters above each clavicle. That's why we have to be careful um, if we are uh, like with a clavicle or a clavicular um, fractures. We could puncture a lung, um, not only with the subclavian artery, but also we can end up giving them pneumos um, because we the bone fragments can actually slice the lungs. All right, so differential diagnosis versus that assessment-based intervention. So differential diagnosis, so basically we're trying to rule things out. Um, we start looking at different things and we're trying to you know, rule out this, rule that in, versus assessment-based interventions. In other words, we see something, we fix it. Whatever we find along the way, we try to fix it. So we just need to figure out which one is going to be the best for us. So, uh, general impression. This is what I talk about. You know, I've preached all through this paramedic refresher, and I'll probably preach some more. Um, you have to get good at that general impression. Are they sick or are they not sick? Look at it. Look at them from the door. Are they looking through you or are they looking at you? Are they nasal flaring? Is their mouth hanging open? Are their mucous membranes dry? Are they having intercostal retractions, supraclavicular retractions, um, you know, super ep um, epigastric retractions? These are all things that we need to look at. Whether it's a life threat, I mean, or remember if we're talking about the pediatric population, 
there's no doubt that, you know, if they are respiratory ill, they're on the potential of a cardiac collapse, and we need to make sure we get them to the hospital fairly fast and start intervening. Their position, are they tripoding? Are they in a sniffing position? Are they just laying down on the couch relaxing? What kind of respiratory effort? Is it shallow? Is it rapid? Is it deep? Is it slow? The ability to talk, you know, obviously this kid's not going to be able to talk here, but, you know, in the adult population or, you know, the kids that are actually able to talk, are they able to talk to you while they're having the respiratory difficulty? What's their mental status? How is it? Is it, you know, are they, once again, are they looking through you? Or are they looking at you? Are they, you know, talking out of their heads? What's their mental status? Because they may not be getting oxygen to their brain and then any kind of perfusion they may have. All right, so you can see it looks like those are, uh, looks like gunshot wounds and maybe uh, stab wounds. But initial assessment for us, we have to look at airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposed. So the airway, we're always looking at, you know, are they breathing? How are they breathing? Are they having nasal flaring? How is it, you know, are they able to talk to me? Are they able to swallow their secretions? Not able to swallow secretions? Any kind of major injuries that would cause airway compromise? Breathing, this is where we're looking, we're listening, we're feeling. So we're looking for equal chest rise and fall. We're looking to make sure that they don't have any kind of tracheal deviation. Um, we're making sure that, you know, from a breathing standpoint, do they have nasal flaring because they're air hungry? We make sure that we look, expose them. We look at their back, we look at their chest, we look at their neck, make sure that there's no kind of airway compromise. Always make sure we look at their circulation. We always make sure we want to find out what their disability is. And everything that we expose, we need to cover back up. Because if they are having a blood loss or they are in shock, we don't want things to be worse. So for life-threatening uh, respiratory distress, our mental status, severe cyanosis. They have that diminished or absent breath sounds. They have an audible strider or one or two word dyspnea. If they're tachycardic, they have power and, and diaphoresis or they're pale and diaphoretic. Retractions and or use of accessory muscles. So these are all things that we need to look at. If we find these things on our initial assessment, we need to make sure that we load them up, get them to the hospital. All right, so for a detailed assessment, what's their chief complaint? Is it shortness of breath or is it chest pain? <clears throat> Excuse me, what's their history? What's their past medical history? What's the history of their present illness? You know, when did it start? What happened when it started? What were you doing when it started? We want to make sure we get a full set of vital signs. That means a blood pressure, a pulse. We want to make sure we check for You can see in that picture he's checking for pedal pulses, checking for carotids, we're checking for femoral pulses. Making sure we get a good pulse oximetry. We want to see if we can get a good end tidal CO2 on them. Um, basically, you want to get as many vital signs as you can because you want to start ruling things out and you want to figure out what your course of action is going to be. Listen to their breath sounds. Listen to their chest. Listen mid-axillary, mid-colvicular, and make sure you listen on their uh, posterior. So then you got the cough um, and a temperature. So we're ruling out the temperature. So we've got thermometers and every single medic should be able to do that. And ask them about their cough. Is there a productive cough? What color is it? Is there any blood in your sputum? Is it green? How long has it been going on? Anything make it better or anything make it worse? Clinical findings, we want to look at their appearance, their position, their ability to speak, and their breath sounds. For diagnostic, so taking their vital signs, getting a 12 of the EKG on them, what's their numbers on pulse oximetry, what's their numbers on capnography. So things we're going to deal with from a medical standpoint, we have COPD, congestive heart failure, pneumonia, anaphylaxis, and then any other kind of associate respiratory issues. Remember, COPD includes chronic bronchitis, emphysema, and asthma. So the diseases often coexist. So in other words, a lot of these people have all three of the diseases, and that's why they call it chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, because they kind of are similar in their and our treatment and just the way they run our bodies. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's different degrees of each may be present in the same patient. 
So with chronic bronchitis, the bronchi are filled with excess mucus. There's inflammatory changes, excessive bronchial mucus production. They have a prolonged exposure to any kind of irritants that can cause this chronic bronchitis. So for emphysema, they have a pathological lung changes that progresses slowly and over many, many years. They have a reduced elasticity in air trapping that decreases the alveolar membrane surface area and the pulmonary capillaries. Their chest may become rigid. That's why they call them barrel. It's like a barrel chest. And that's because their lungs are expanding. And their, sorry, their ribs are expanding to increase the amount of room that it's going to take because their lungs are losing that elasticity. They'll definitely have a sustry muscle use to breathe. And the exhalation becomes a muscular act. In other words, they are trying to push this air out. And they have air trapping. So it becomes a very muscular act. So if they have weak chest wall muscles, they're going to have a hard time expelling this air. Remember, asthma is a restrictive airway disease. Um, and it's common in children and young adults. Child asthma may improve with age. Um, adult asthma usually it will persist. It will just keep going. The episodes of varial duration. They have an increased uh, resistance to airflow, which causes alveolar hypotension, ventilation perfusion, uh, matching increase hypoxemia, carbon dioxide retention stimulates the hyperventilation. The reversible airflow obstruction is due to bronchial smooth muscle contraction, mucus hypersecretion, and bronchial plugging, and the inflammatory changes in the bronchial walls. All right, here's a picture of the bronchial is obstructed on the expiration. So they don't have a hard time getting the air in. They have a hard time getting the air out. Increased airway resistance causes air trapping, so they have the excessive demand on the muscle, muscle respiration. Greater accessory muscle use and definitely an increase in respiratory fatigue. All right, so things that we need to look for. Um, are they obtunded? Are they able to basically follow commands? They, are they in a the tripod position? Are they using their accessory muscles? How are they presenting? How are they presenting in order to get that air in? Are they in a sniffing position? Are they very anxious? They're anxious because they can't breathe. Are they anxious because they're hypoxic? They have very poor floppy muscle tone. Um, things that we're going to find are respiratory distress, tachycardia or tachypnea. If they're diaphoretic. They have any kind of power. They have intercostal retractions. They have supraclavicular retractions. Um, super gastric retractions. If they're dyspnea, after one or two words, they go to talk and they lose their breath. If their intertidal CO2 is greater than 45 millimeters of mercury or below 35 millimeters of mercury, or I should say 30 with severe respiratory distress. And remember, lethargy, exhaustion, agitation, and confusion are signal impending respiratory failure. You need to, if you see these things, you need to make sure you take care of it. Before it becomes a huge problem, and you may want to make sure you get all your innovation equipment out. All right, so status asthmaticus. Status asthmaticus, severe prolonged asthma, exacerbation, not broken, repeat doses of bronchodilators. This is a true emergency. They can't breathe. You have to get them to the hospital. It requires early recognition, so figure it out that this isn't helping, and they're in a status asthmaticus. It's imminent danger of respiratory failure. Things that we want to do, we give high flow oxygen, we give them continuous bronchial dilators, we start an IV for rehydration. Definitely consider BiPAP or CPAP. Epinephrine, and eh, maybe not. Uh, I'm sorry, steroids, maybe not. You know, pre hospital. Epinephrine, definitely. Somebody that's in status asthmaticus, you want to make sure that you give them epinephrine because we want to make sure that we give them both for the beta and the alpha uh, properties. And it talks about magnesium sulfate. We don't have magnesium sulfate uh, pre-hospital in our area. However, there are a lot of areas in the countries that do. We want to consider intertricular innovation. That's rapid sequence sedation. That's what that RSS is. So we want to consider the rapid sequence sedation. And right now we don't have automate, but ketamine is going to be an option for us. Putting the albuterol down the ET tube and then bagging it in. We typically don't do that because we have um, BVM nebulizer kits, so we can bag in a breathing treatment now. We ventilate at 6 to 10 breaths per minute. All right, so it talks about glitter lung. 
you know, just real quick, I don't want to take too much time on this because it's not something you're going to see very often. But it says uh, it's a glarolon, it's a respiratory disease caused by a chronic inhalation of a precision cut, um, iridescent, metatazol, yeah, metalized particles. Elementary school art teachers and transgender jag queen entertainers are the populations most at risk. So basically, um, the art school teachers or the uh, school art teachers are the ones that are going to end up getting the glitter in their lungs because of all different projects. And then uh, the transgender entertainers will get it from putting the glitter and stuff on their faces and on their chest. All right, so it says the airborne glitter enters through the nose and the mouth. It's first attracted to the glue-like mucous membranes. The glitter then settles into the lungs. Deposits cause scarring, inflammation, and uh, twinkleness of the lungs, leading to or betalazemia, which is a condition in which the alveoli are so sparkly that oxygen molecules are reflected away from the bloodstream. And then eventually the alveoli become completely de um, decorated or unable to function, which is leading to massive system failure due to oxygen starvation. Right, so remember medical interventions for us. This is case based. Not everybody's going to get treated the same. It's kind of a case by case scenario. Breathing treatments, we give them beta agonists or the albuterol. Um, any kind of steroids, um, they may give them solumedrol or something at the hospital. Mag sulfate, we don't give pre hospital in our area. However, it's very, very popular at the hospitals. CPAP, we can do um, as long as they're above the age of 16. We assist for ventilations if it's needed. We consider an abation early. We give them rapid transport. And we make sure we notify the hospital so they can have respiratory ready and the physicians or nurses or whatever make sure they're ready so that way if the person does crash, they're able to intervene. Okay, so for CPAP, this is positive airway pressure. We make sure that they are a spontaneously breathing patient. Once again, if they are in cardiac respiratory distress, they have agonal breathing, CPAP doesn't help them any. It's an increase in airway pressure, which allows better uh, diffusion of the gas in the alveolar area expansion. Lower airway pressure, make sure you coach and reassure the patient. It is very difficult, it's very foreign to them to have a mask over top of their face unless they have a a machine that they use at night, like a CPAP machine at night, um, or a BiPAP machine at night when they go to sleep, they're probably not going to be used to this, and they're already having a hard time breathing, feel like they're suffocating, now you're going to go and put a CPAP mask on them, make sure you coach them and reassure them. Always inter um, invasively by the ET tube, and non-invasively by a mask or a nose mask for CPAP, so we can hook it up either way, it doesn't always have to be by mask. Ooh, that's a bad day right there. So for trauma, you know, I would hope everybody knows that you know typically we're going to see it from a uh, motor vehicle collision, calls, uh, falls, I'm sorry, and penetrating trauma. Uh, any impact, it's typically life-threatening, and for us, it's interventional. In other words, you know, case by case, and we just do interventions. But if you come across something like that, that's a, definitely a bad day right there. All right, so you can see that that is actually a local uh, truck there. Um, we're dispatched to a two-vehicle motor vehicle collision. Upon arrival, we find a 53-year-old male who was under strain backseat passenger, a high-speed T-bone type collision. He's got a high imp or he's got an impact on his side of the vehicle. Okay, so what are we going to do for this guy? All right, so we find his, his assessment. He's got a patent airway. His respiratory rate is 40. His SATs are in the crapper at 76%. He's having trouble breathing. He's got crepitus over his right chest wall, diminished breath sounds over the left chest wall. Pulse is up, so he's tachycardic. He's hypertensive. He's got active bleeding from a scalp laceration. He's awake. His GCS is 14. He's got a tense distended abdomen. So, wow, index of suspicion. This guy is very, very ill. So what are we going to do for him? You know, we need to take care of the respiratory problem. We need to make sure we get our, rest, we get our innovation equipment out fairly quickly. He's already got a crevice over the right chest wall, so we may want to pad that. The diminished breath sounds over the left chest wall. That could be indicative of him having a pneumo. He could have a tension pneumo. So we need to be very, very aware. We need to always keep an eye on that. If his pulse is up, his blood pressure is up, he's got active bleeding, 
His GCS is only 14, but he's got a tense extended abdomen. He's probably bleeding in his belly. He may end up having a hemo, or it may be a pneumo. Who knows? It could be a hemo pneumo. However, this guy is very, very ill. All right, so why can't he breathe? He's got multiple right rib fractures, including the rib number one. He's got multiple left rib fractures with a flail segment. He's got a left clavicular fracture, bilateral hemoneumothoraces, and a bilateral pulmonary contusion. That is a bad day, no doubt. Okay, so for trauma interventions, oxygen therapy, needle decompression, advanced airway management, early endotracheal innovation, alternative airways such as the King Airway, rapid sequence sedation, which we can do in this area, rapid sequence intubation, which we cannot do, that's a paral or that's when you paralyze somebody. Rapid sequence sedation obviously is when we put them to sleep, but doesn't necessarily mean they're sedated. I'm sorry, they may not necessarily be paralyzed where the RSI is actually being paralyzed. And then a very, very last resort is a cricothyrotomy or a needle crike or using the quick trach. That's the last, last thing you want to use. All right. Okay, so real quick, just to kind of summarize thing. Uh, remember, a shortness of breath is a very common complaint. I don't think I have to tell anybody that. You must identify the best treatment strategies based on your assessment. So... Look at the patient, assess the patient, figure out what the best treatment is going to be. Not every patient is treated the same or is presents the same. And it says usually your emergency. This is respiratory emergencies are a big deal because people get to, they can compensate for so long. Once they start decompensating, you're going to have a hard time even keeping them uh, down because of the of them being so hypoxic or in turn them just not being able to follow commands like they should. All right. So, let's see here. We'll just skip through all that because that really has nothing to do with this lecture. Okay, so another short lecture. That is the end of the lecture. Thanks.